all of that is true. And I, I just wanted to reiterate that the, um, that the, I think it's the San Francisco Insight Meditation Center that's offering this uh, kind of like, you know, work around white uh, privilege and white body ship. <laughs> We're in the white body ship. If, we, if you're in the white body ship this life around, which I am, uh, this type of work has been really important to me. And to do it through uh, the Dharma lens is even more transformative. I think, uh, in some ways, for those who are interested in Dharma, there's so many aspects of the Buddha's teachings that were so and are so in line with, you know, uncovering our unperceived biases. I mean, isn't that mindfulness meditation? <laughs> and uh, unpacking our privilege and um, empathy and putting ourselves in the other's shoes. I mean, that's all the type of work that we've been doing in the, the mind training classes for the last few years. So dharma is about justice. Actually, dharma can be translated as justice or righteousness. And what could be more righteous than human flourishing and uplifting all of us and uh, being a part of the solution, not a part of the problem, right? So. I want to just encourage everyone, if you haven't done that type of work, then if you can seize this opportunity to do that program that Mace just talked about through the Insight Center, please do. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin with a sit like we usually do. We'll sit for about 30 minutes. So go ahead and make sure you're in a comfortable position, you're warm or cool enough, your notifications are turned off doors are closed, whatever you need to do to create a nice little um, boundary around you, in a sense, you know, the word for retreat in Tibetan is sam, which literally means boundary. So there are outer boundaries, inner boundaries, and secret boundaries. And the outer boundaries can be turning off our notification, closing the door, telling our family we're meditating, don't bother me, <laughs> going to a cabin in the woods, you know, those are setting outer boundaries. The inner boundary is to set the intention to watch the mind and see when certain energies are coming in or pulling us out or, you know, there's these more and more subtle, subtle aspects of what hum means. Um, and so those outer boundaries are actually important, you know, especially when we're newer to practice, we need some structure and some outer support so that then we can work with the mind. So let's get comfortable making sure we're in a, in a nice place. I feel like somebody's not muted. I'm going to mute. Yeah, maybe Mace, we should be careful about that in case somebody wants to, or mistakenly, unintentionally unmute himself. So allow the eyes to close and Begin by taking some deep breaths and releasing tension with the out breath. Feeling the breath, filling the body, filling the torso, the lungs, the belly, the kidneys, front, back, side, body. Releasing, holding tension, tightness with the out breath. And as we're settling in, notice if the spine is a little off to one side or slouching over. Feel the spine like a, a stack of golden coins, the vertebrae, stacked one atop another. Lifting up towards the, the sky. And then the sits bones, the tailbone, the coccyx, rooting, magnetized down towards the core of the earth. Shoulders fall away from the ears. The chest becomes buoyant, slightly lifted a little bit. And notice if the chin juts forward, then gently notice. You can just bring the chin slightly back towards the center of the throat. That elongates the back of the neck and creates that shepherd's crook 
hook through the neck in the skull shape. The eyes can be closed or slightly open, gazing at a comfortable angle. Downward cast, relax the muscles behind and around the eyes. Let the vision, the gaze go soft. If they are open. The tip of the tongue resting at the upper palate, just at the root of the front top teeth. And relax the root of the tongue down towards the heart. And let that instigate a release through the jaw. The lower molars releasing away from the upper molars. The lips can be gently closed or slightly parted as you wish. Feel the belly soft, relax the belt line, the hips, the legs in a comfortable position, the arms relax, the hands on your lap or on your thighs, palms down if you wish. And in your own personal way, take a moment to arouse your own heartfelt motivation for your practice, clarifying, crystallizing your intention for your life, for your inner life. Your spiritual life. Infusing that with the, the wish of bodhicitta to be of benefit for yourself and others through practice. And in a gentle, unforced way, we'll glide right into kind of a more concerted focus of the breath as it flows in and out of the body, through the nose and or mouth, filling the lungs, descending down like you're filling a pitcher of water, filling from the base to the top. And when you breathe out, feeling that emptying, like the water is being poured out of the vase from the top to the base. Releasing distraction, just letting the mind alight upon the flow of the in and the out breath, the sensations as they arise in the body. And internally, you can count from one to 21. Just a gentle, silent count, a light touch at the top of each in-breath. Just attending to the sensations and releasing distraction, releasing any fixation or grasping that arises as soon as you notice and come back to the breath. And let the mind rest at ease, alighting upon the breath. Counting from one to 21 in your own time, in silence.
if the eyes are closed, begin to shift into settling the mind in its natural state with the eyes slightly open, gazing at a downward angle. Let the gaze be vacant, soft. Feel as if you could see 360 degrees around you. And not staring at any one thing in particular, but let the eyes be soft, as if you're gazing into the space, the fabric of space itself. Release any counting. The anchor shifts from solely the breath to the domain of the mind itself. Awareness of the breath is still there, like maintaining your hand on a buoy, the surface of the ocean. The breath rising and falling, like the buoy rising and falling on the surface of the water. You can always return to the breath if you get too far out, too distracted. But primarily we're shifting our attention to attend to the appearances that arise within this space or the domain of the mind itself. As if you were watching actors on a stage. Uh, Enter and exit from stage left, stage right. Thoughts arising and passing, ever shifting. Appearing yet empty like a rainbow in the sky. Or an illusion. To observe and release any grasping or fixation or the ahankara, the eye-making faculty that fixates onto thoughts and takes them for being who we really are. Sit back in your seat a bit, metaphorically, and observe these thoughts, feelings, sensations arise and pass within this arena, this domain of the mind. Relax the muscles of the face, the brow, the jaw, shoulders. Notice if the chin jets forward, draw it slightly back towards the center of the throat, lengthening the space at the base of the skull.
There may be times when you oscillate between a stillness, a spaciousness. Perhaps you observe within that stillness movement, but you're not hooked into it. It's called the union of stillness and movement. There are other times where we may feel really caught or fused with thought. And one tool for that is actually to practice vipassana with those thoughts or with that particular thought. And in this structure of more of the Dzogchen shamatha practice, we can do this vipassana practice in the vein of observing the source, location, and then the destination of the thought. So if a thought arises, then notice, try to find where does that come from. And really look. And also look, where does it abide? Where is its resting place after it's arisen? And really look. Can you find it? And lastly, then, observe where it goes, its, lo- its destination. And really look, can you see where it goes? In a sense, you're using the mind to transform the mind, giving it something to do when it's feeling very active or agitated be very effective. And after spending some time in that inquiry, then you can relax and sink back into just observing without probing, without vipassana. and rest in that luminosity that remains, that clarity, that knowing quality that is inherent within your own mind. This suffuses all of the comings and goings. And let yourself rest. This unadorned, natural state, uncontrived, unforced, uncreated, just rest, and we'll practice in silence.
And in the last few moments, let go of any effort, any residual effort or posturing or structure even. Just rest completely. Let it all go. Just let yourself be in this simple presence of mind in the body. And then closing the practice with your own personal internal prayer of dedication. Any positive energy of this practice be of benefit. And then we'll come back together. If there are any questions or comments that want to come up directly out of practice, I always like to allow some time for that. And if not, that's okay too. Also, any sharing in the chat, if you prefer, is okay. I'm hoping that some of you, at least those who, who are somewhat regular or have experience with this style of meditation, can can shift and can appreciate the, the different nuances of when we shift the anchor of our shamatha or calm abiding practice, right? So the beginning, we focus, you know, even at the very beginning, we focused on the body. We did the seven-point pra- uh, posture of Vairochana, this classic structure of, you know, resting the tongue at the palate, the chin in, the shoulders down, spine straight, you know, that's not shamatha per se, but it sets you up for an awareness in the body. And then the first main anchor is the breath. Very common. It's not the only anchor. You could also take a mantra or a visualization of a seed syllable or a vajra or a look at a pebble or a stick even. Really anything can be your anchor sound but we did the breath for 21 and then we opened and we shifted the anchor to to what does anyone remember could chat it the awareness of mind yeah the domain of the mind just slightly different than the awareness of the mind. I mean, that's happening. <laughs> but then the next step is awareness of awareness. So that's a bit more um, etheric. So we could say this is settling the mind in its natural state. The object of meditation is the domain of the mind, that space within which thoughts and feelings, sensation, memories, emotions arise and pass. So that's your anchor. And then awareness of awareness is actually shamatha without an anchor. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the anchor is awareness. You're anchored in awareness, but it's like water and water fusing. So there's no mind being anchored onto something else it's fused but those first two are mindfulness with an anchor with an object the breath in the first case the domain of the mind if remember alan just imprinted that in my mind 
you know, he quiz us on it. <laughs> what are we doing here? Settling the mind in its natural state, the domain of the mind is the anchor, is the object. Karen. Um, thank you, Chandra. That was really great. And um, I just wanted to say I really like the last part where you just told us to rest. I really, when that happened, I just felt like my shoulders dropped like three inches and <laughs> it was just really nice. And I liked that part. And also it was kind of challenging, um, uh -huh. which I was relieved by. And then I was like, oh, actually, I'm actually having some trouble doing this. <laughs> um, so I didn't know if you could talk more about that last part because it was, uh, it, was that kind of the awareness of awareness or was it something different or separate or the same? The cat just answered your question. <laughs> she just came crawling out from under the couch. So I'll have to let her out soon. Yeah. Um, in a way, that is the real meditation. You know, like when we're not striving, when we the shoulders drop, when we're just we just are. That's what all the the teachers, the masters, the texts, the instructions are trying to get us to is that natural state yeah yeah so it's 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 comedic when we we've been sitting for a while and we realize oh we're really we're still posturing you know there's still this subtle thought i'm meditating i better apply the antidote or focus on the object and you know there's the eye in there doing something and what the great teachers have old have said for centuries is you're not really meditating as long as you're efforting the natural state you, you just are you know i mean that's the sign of a true master when they just natural just i'll never forget really one of the first times i was in a sustained present in sustained presence of someone who could hold that state was when i traveled with one of my teachers um Hunkar Dorje Rinpoche to Tibet. And we experienced, this was in 99, 98? This was in 98, 1998. We had all sorts of obstacles on the road, breakdown, the car, you know, authorities stopping us. We're not allowed here. We, we got lost there. We just all sorry, we got sick, you know, everything you can imagine. <laughs> was going wrong and he was so calm and grounded and non-reactive throughout this whole thing that really it was one of the greatest dharma teachings i've ever had to this day it's just to be with someone who was in that natural state you know it's like the real deal so in a way that last moment of like okay now drop you know that's the that's actually when your meditation really happened but then, of course, the mind is still doing its thing, and there's some instability, and so it can be hard because the old habits want to come in and fantasize and take you away. And that's okay. Yeah, Claudia is echoing the same feeling, exactly the same when you said rest. Yeah, good. So now, um, you know, I try to say those things in the beginning, but of course we're, we're all settling in and it just takes us time to get there, even if it's the instructions there. It just takes time. You know, we're doing time in retreat and on meditation. I mean, there's somebody in this group tonight who I just spoke to recently on the phone who did a three-year retreat. You know, he probably knows better than anyone that you're kind of just doing time. <laughs> you're letting yourself unravel, unwind, and that takes time. You can't just say, unwind now, <laughs> you know, relax now. It, it, we need the natural arc of that unwinding to do it on, of its own accord. And then, then we find ourselves in the natural state. So it takes time. It can take time. So, um, so Leanne says something about... Uh, their favorite thing when meditating, fantasize about how centered and magnetically enlightened I'll be once I really commit to meditating. <laughs> then remember, I'm currently supposed to be meditating and instantly get bored. Thank you for your honesty, Leanne. I so appreciate that. That's really funny and so true. How many people have had those experiences? <laughs> yeah. 
you're not alone. I've had that too. It's this big joke. It's a tragic joke. It's funny and also tragic because um, it's in a way sometimes we're our own worst enemy in those cases where we we uh, we finally get to the cushion and then we're there and we can't wait to get off or we're fantasizing about other things or someday when I'm on the cushion oh wait I'm on the cushion now <laughs> it's 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 our human condition it's it's the way we are and we're going to talk about that actually in tonight's topic so that's a good lead in is there anything else before we dive in Are you guys doing are you guys reading the book? Do you have the book? Are you enjoying it? Some people are. Some people aren't. That's okay. You don't need the book if you don't want to. Denise says yes. So again, this is what we're reading if you're new to the class on the path to enlightenment. It's a uh, edited by Matthew Ricard. It's a series of wonderful quotes of great sages through the ages in Tibet. Um Heart advice from the great Tibetan masters. So tonight we are in chapter five, five. Each week, more or less, we've managed to go through a chapter. And you may have noticed, you may not have noticed, uh, and I think I mentioned this before we even started the, the book study, is that this book, the way Matthew Ricard structured it, is based on the classic Nundro or preliminary practices structure found within the Nyingma, also in Kagyu uh, traditions. I think the Sakya as well. The Geluk do a different version. But you'll notice that part one that's called Turning the Mind to the Spiritual Path, there are five chapters in that part one. And they touch on the four thoughts that turn the mind towards the Dharma, or sometimes called the four revolutions um, uh, Lodok Ji I believe is what it's called the Namto the Lodok Ji Lodok means to reverse Ji means the number four and so the first was the value of human existence or often called the precious human life so contemplating that and then the second chapter is Reflections on Impermanence and Death. So for those of you who've done our Lojong classes, these are very familiar themes here, classic Dharma, especially found within Tibetan approach. And then the third is, um, it's called here From Seed to Fruit, or the Law of Cause and Effect, meaning karma, contemplating cause and effect, karma. We did that when I was with you two weeks ago. And then the fourth thought that turns the mind is the inherent unsatisfactoriness of the world conditioned by ignorance, right? So Eve touched on that last week. All of these are on our YouTube channel. If you want to catch up, you can listen at your leisure. And then what's interesting is here, there's a five, which is common in the Nundro, in this other framework of mind training. This is just another way of training the mind, the Lojong, mind training. And this fifth category is giving up the causes of suffering. <laughs> really the theme for tonight, giving up the causes of suffering, that's another way of saying renunciation, which is kind of a loaded term. So the topic for tonight is renunciation, that's chapter five. And uh, we'll go through some of the highlights of the quotations in this chapter. And um, but the first thing I'd like to say is, what Alan Wallace likes to say about renunciation is that when you translate the Tibetan term literally, um, it's Nepar Jungwa, something Nepar Jungwa. It's been a while since I've looked at the Tibetan, but it means the spirit of emergence is how you could li more literally closely translate renunciation from the Tibetan word. And I like that. And, and because it's really meant to be not a heavy-handed, you should do this, you should renounce pleasure, you should renounce your favorite things in the world, renounce your family and go live in the cave, you know, out of a sense of, of, um, of, of um, kind of a imposition. 
but instead practice dharma from a place of inspiration you know a spirit of emerging out of the muck of samsara of, su of suffering of your own turmoil and so that's much more uplifting and of course that's come coming from within you not from without not as a should remember my one-liner that my first ashtanga yoga teacher used to always say i won't should on you if you don't should on me <laughs> So it's like that. I'm not shooting on you, and I don't think the Buddha would want to shoot on you either. So this is um, the topic for tonight. I see Walt is uh, texting in something very true that I find as well, that the audio version of this book is fabulous. Just get it. <laughs> if you can, get it. It's so good. Uh, it might even be on YouTube. Um, the narrator is a real pro. He's done a lot of Dharma books, by the way. I can't remember his name, but he's a, he's a very seasoned narrator with a fine, fine voice. And I've listened to this audiobook probably four times over, and I've listened to it at night, putting me to sleep. I've listened to it on load, long road trips, really going about your day. It's like suffusing. I've listened to it on retreat. It helps suffuse your mind with the Dharma, like dyeing wool in dye. You know, it just... It sinks in, it sinks in, it sinks in. So please get that if you can. So back to renunciation. One thing that Matthew Ricard says in his short introduction, this is on page 45, is that renunciation, or you can say the spirit of emergence, um, essentially means simplifying one's mind, one's words and one's activities by letting go of what obstructs inner freedom. And I love this. He says, constraint creates frustration. Renunciation produces a real sense of joy. So we're not constraining. We're emerging with inspiration, emerging out of the activities, the ways of thinking, the ways of speaking that cause us, that bind us, that block our freedom. We emerge out of that with a sense of inspiration to emerge from it. So I'll read that one sentence again, because he's saying constraint creates frustration. Like if we come at it heavy handed, if we should on ourselves, then we get frustrated and then we don't want to do it. We say, screw it. I'm out of here. Right? Do you do that? I do that. It's human nature, but if we have the spirit of emergence that comes really from the inside up, out, that produces a real sense of joy because we know it's good for us. It feels good. It's nourishing. He says, renunciation does not mean depriving oneself of what is truly good and useful in life, but rather getting rid of unnecessary burdens. That's nice. Then he says, you know, the advice that follows is often very direct and blunt. This is probably intentional since for most of us, the desire for renunciation is not a natural impulse. We're definitely not taught it in our culture. And in fact, we're taught the opposite. Buy more, consume more, you know, try more things to fill that void. Fill it up with stuff. So the first quote is by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and it's a beautiful one. It helps to set the stage. And then we're going to read from a really wonderful longer poem. And then I want to end the night with a story, Milarepa story. So if at any time there are questions, please feel free to raise your hand or chat it in, okay? Or comments. So the Dalai Lama says, when the teachings say we need to reduce our fascination with the things of this life, it does not mean that we should abandon them completely. This is on page 46. It means avoiding the natural tendency to go from elation to depression in reaction to life's ups and downs jumping for joy when you have some success or wanting to jump out of the window if you do not get what you want. 
Being less concerned about the affairs of this life means assuming its ups and downs with a broad and stable mind. That's the equanimity. We've talked a lot about that in the past, the equanimity or one taste, right? One taste doesn't mean that everything is bland and tastes the same, right? It means that the way that we experience the myriad of flavors and experiences has an even keel to it. It has a wisdom into in it, knowing that, okay, I might be really elated right now. This is fun. <laughs> I'll take it. But I also know it's impermanent and things change, so I'm not going to fixate or grasp onto it too much because just like the suffering, it will change. I'm same with suffering, you know. One day we feel like we want to end it all. But if in that space we can remember, yeah, but this too can change, you know. Like, I've come out of this before. I can come out of it again. So I appreciate that he's saying it's not about turning away from the world. You know, most of us are not monastics. I think all of us maybe. I'm not sure. I don't want to assume. We haven't fully renounced the world. So we have to learn how to be in it. Like, I want to have freedom. I'll jump for joy again. I'll definitely jump for joy. I'm not going to not jump for joy because I'm trying to practice Dharma. Like, I'll jump for joy. (laughs) But... As I'm jumping for joy, I will be doing it with, you know, a sense of, I like to say, maturity, wisdom. I definitely won't be jumping out a window, though. I promise you that. I will not jump out a window right now. I make the vow. (laughs) So, um, okay, next quote is... Um, a beautiful, it's quite long, so I'm not going to read the full poem. It, this is on page 51 by Jamgun Kongtro Lodra Taye, one of the greats, one of the great non-sectarian masters of the, I think, 17th, 18th, 1800s. And it says that... Um, So in this long poem, he kind of uses a classical structure of using natural metaphor for things. After bowing to his teachers, the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, Avalokiteshvara and Tara, it's very common to begin a poem or a song with bowing to these uh, important people and characters. he begins to lay out the illusory nature of existence, right? This is setting the stage for renunciation or for the spirit of emergence, where we we start to condition and teach the mind not to take things so seriously, so solidly. And so he goes through a series of beautiful natural metaphors. And I'll just read the first line of each stanza because it gives you a, a bird's eye perspective of his technique and what he's getting at. He says in the the first main stanza, this human life is as fleeting as a dream. In the next one, it says, this human life is like a flame exposed to the wind. Then he goes on addressing the mind. The reasonings of the intellect are deceptive illusions. Then in the next one, companions are like a flock of birds perched on a tree. They come together, they disperse, they come and they go, right? So you can see the beautiful poetry. I, if I read the whole poem to you, it would take a long time. So read it on your own. But I just want to highlight these beautiful natural metaphors. And then we're going to go deep on a few of the stanzas a bit later, okay? The next page, 52, he says, the, this illusory body is like an old ruin. Um, Meaning, you know, whether it's robust or decrepit, uh, unhampered by seeking clothes, food, and medicines, sincerely practice the Supreme Dharma. Okay, so 
He says, as for knowledge that is useless in time of need, like a deer's antlers, never mind if I know it or not, which is a funny image, you know, like in a way, all of our knowledge is kind of like a crown or kind of like a beautiful antler set uh, rack. You know, it's, it's maybe useful at times, right? But in true times of need, perhaps like at the moment of death, from a Buddhist perspective, is really the final test. You know, the crown or the jewels or the deer's antler is useless. And then this one's funny. This is worth reading out loud because these things always make me laugh. This is why I love the Tibetan tradition, because they are so good at self-effacement as a form of teaching and um, humor. He writes, the trappings of a lama, of a teacher, a guru, make me look like a dog turd wrapped in brocade. <laughs> Whether I have them or not, meaning the brocade and the trappings, may I, by seeing the rottenness of my own head, sincerely practice the supreme dharma, the supreme dharma. So... You know, you know, they're really a good, good, good teacher when they can say these funny jokes about themselves, right? I mean, they don't take themselves too seriously. Then he goes on, friends and relatives are like visitors to a market. Sometimes they're friendly, sometimes they're hostile, they come and they go. Material goods are like a treasure found in a dream, right? Social rank is like a baby bird landing on the top of a tree. I thought that was a great, funny, funny natural metaphor. Social rank, you're like, you think you're so great, but really you're just a tiny bird perched on the very tippy top of the tree. <laughs> um, the next stanza, the top of 53, quickness to analyze is like a snout of a pig. <laughs> Meditative experiences come and go like a summer torrent. So don't get attached to your bliss or your pain. You know, they come and they go. He says, these freedoms and favorable conditions are like the wish-fulfilling gem. Now he's talking about positive things, in a sense, right? So, I mean, all those other things are positive at times. Um, but he says, without them, these favorable conditions, I would be unable to apply the instructions May I, without wasting them, while I still have them, sincerely practice the Supreme Dharma. That's an ode to the preciousness of human life, you know, the first thought that turns the mind. Then he talks about how important the teacher is. The glorious master illuminates the path of liberation. Without having met him, I would have no means, him or her, Without having met him or her, I would have no means to comprehend the ultimate nature of things. Not jumping into the abyss, now I know where I am going. May I sincerely practice the supreme dharma. And so then he continues saying, this supreme teaching of dharma is like a panacea. He says, this alternation of joys and sufferings is like the cycle of the seasons. So again, natural metaphor, natural metaphor. Then he goes on, more metaphors. I'm going to jump ahead. And so now he kind of gets to the crux of it. And towards the bottom of page 56, where it says the natural state. Now we're going to really dig into these last stanzas. He says, the natural state of mind is like immutable space. So in a way, that's what we were trying to drop into, or not trying, but just dropping into, at the end of the sit, right? The resting, the letting be. Is just that natural, that natural state of mind. He says, is like immutable space. Unless one discovers it, efforts to apply antidotes will never end. 
And instead of putting fetters on my own legs, may I sincerely practice the Supreme Dharma. This is so important. This natural state of mind is like a mutable space. Unless one discovers it, efforts to apply antidotes will never end. So you experienced that, Karen, and I think Claudia, Denise, somebody else, maybe others did too, is that basically as long like as long as you haven't really discovered or tasted the natural state efforts to apply antidotes will really never end you're going to just spend your whole life trying to find that right antidote but you don't really know where you're trying to get to and that's why they say it's important to have a teacher who can help point that out to you so like in the Dzogchen tradition also in the Kagyut tradition it's very common to be introduced to the nature of your own mind this natural state actually right from the get-go through different means like um, metaphor or symbols or mind to mind uh, transmission so that then you get a taste of it it doesn't mean you're enlightened and it's done it means you've had a little taste and then you know what you're working back towards you know the story of the buddha when he was a young boy sitting under the i think it was the apple tree or crab apple tree a rose apple tree some special tree he was contemplating he was just resting he'd been out playing in the gardens as a young boy and he leaned back against the the trunk of the tree and completely let go just relaxed and he says in that moment he experienced the natural state suffused with bliss ease and in fact many years later when he was on the eve of enlightenment under the bodhi tree another tree and he was kind of in his, in the midst of his search he hadn't reached his destination of enlightenment yet he had the thought could enlightenment be like that feeling that naturalness I felt as a young boy under that tree. And then that is when his enlightenment unfolded. So in a sense, perhaps all of us have had that experience as a youth, sometimes it's peak experiences. And so what he's saying here, again, I'm going to read it again. The natural state of mind is like immutable space. Immutable space, meaning it's like Vajra-like, it's adamantine, it's indestructible, it's unchanging, it's vast, be, some beyond what we can conceptualize. That's the natural state of your, your own mind. And unless you've tasted it or discovered it, is how he says it here, efforts to apply antidotes will never end. So don't fret if you haven't tasted it. You will in a way it's it's going to come through the unraveling through the letting go not through the constructing and fixing and purifying and perfecting and doing and doing and doing right it's an unwinding it's a letting go like the buddha did as a boy so instead of putting fetters on my own legs may i sincerely practice the supreme dharma meaning keep tasting that then he goes on, the next stanza, the nature of pure awareness, rigpa, is like a stainless crystal. So here's another natural metaphor. Without realizing it, one does not acquire the certainty that it has no root or foundation. Not seeking elsewhere what is already within, may I sincerely practice the Supreme Dharma. So the nature of pure awareness is like a stainless crystal. So this, this is another common metaphor for the nature of mind, is a crystal. The crystal seems clear, but then when light shines through it, then it gives rise to a myriad of rainbow colors, right? Manifestation. Likewise, the mind is that kind of clear, uh, unaltered, kind of crystal-like state. 
but then due to appearances or feelings or karmas or different circumstances, then the colors arise, then the appearances manifest. And so what he's saying is when you don't realize that it is, the mind is like a stainless crystal, then you don't get the certainty that mind has no root or foundation. It is instead space, like space. So that's what the direct experience of meditation gives us, is that feeling of the groundless ground, the rootless root. You know, you're there, you're awake, lucid, And yet there's a quality of immateriality, of groundlessness, the groundless ground. Not seeking elsewhere what is already within. Classic teachings. You know, they say that, that, that often all these antidotes and ways that we make ourselves busy in the world is like a thief looking for a treasure in an empty house. We're trying to find something that's not there. Or on the other hand, not seeking elsewhere what is already within. Instead of going out there to find it, the thief trying to get the treasure out there, we don't need to be a thief because we've got the treasure already within us. May I sincerely practice the Supreme Dharma. The next stanza at the top of 57, the natural simplicity of mind is like an old friend. I love this one. It, it, if its face is unfamiliar, any practice is just deceptive illusion. So again, if you don't, if you don't recognize your own face, which is like an old friend. So Moshe is the word in Tibetan, like a, the recognizing your own nature is actually called recognizing your own face. Does that sound, does that make sense to you? It's like, it's like seeing your true face, seeing who you really are. So the natural simplicity of mind is like an old friend. It's been with you all along, your old compatriot, your best friend. But if its face is unfamiliar, any practice is just deceptive illusion, meaning you're just busy making. Same as what he said before. You're kind of just wasting your time. You're just filling the space. You're making yourself busy with mantra, with technique, with tension, with rules. But all of that's, in a sense, a deceptive illusion. He says, instead of groping my way with my eyes closed, May I sincerely practice the Supreme Dharma. And here, the Supreme Dharma is none other than recognizing your own nature, your own natural simplicity. That's the Supreme Dharma. Then, may the two aspects of the mind of enlightenment arise in my mind. Thanks to the Buddha's essential instructions transmitted by Atisha and practiced by holders of the oral lineage, May all my actions be in harmony with the Supreme Dharma. So this first line, may the two aspects of the mind of enlightenment arise in my mind. What that is, is that it's kind of a wordy way of saying the twofold bodhicitta. Mind of enlightenment is a way that he's translating bodhicitta. And these two aspects of bodhicitta, which some of you have already learned, are the relative level bodhicitta and the ultimate level bodhicitta. Right. So you have the relative level bodhicitta, which is bodhicitta and aspiration, where we work, we cultivate, we aspire to develop qualities of love, compassion, equanimity, and joy. And then we also practice the bodhicitta in action, which is the six perfections. Dana, generosity, as Mace taught us, um, diligence, 
uh, patience, discipline, concentration, and wisdom. So there's a lot packed into there. Then you have the ultimate aspect of bodhicitta. So that was just all the first aspect of bodhicitta. Then you have the ultimate aspect of bodhicitta, which is emptiness, actually interconnectedness. Tendril, the interconnected web of empty fullness. That is the ultimate expression of our awakened heart. So he's saying that um, may these two aspects of bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, arise in my mind. Now there, uh, there's another teaching on the two as two full bo- two um, two aspects of bodhicitta, which is just for self and other. So may I generate bodhicitta for myself and for others. So that's another interpretation of this. Uh, thanks to the Buddha's essential instructions transmitted by Atisha, who let's shout out for our beloved Atisha, our Lojong teacher who brought these compassion teachings from India in the uh, 11th century or 10th and 11th century to Tibet, taught his last 12 years of his life in Tibet, helped to revive Buddhism in Tibet. I taught the Lojong, or he taught the roots of Lojong that later became those slogans that we studied. Um, Very important figure, so thank you to him. And the lineage holders of the oral lineage, the Kagyu is the oral lineage, but it's also all of the lineages that are whispered from mouth to ear, like even this lineage right now. I received from my teachers, you're receiving from me. You're in the oral lineage. (laughs) So he's thanking all of them. May my actions be in harmony with the Supreme Dharma. So this goes on. It's so good. The whole thing till the very end is good, but I'm noticing we just have 10 minutes. So please read the rest of that on your own. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, the natural metaphors are amazing. I remember when I was an undergrad at UCSB, which had a really great Buddhist studies program and religious studies program. I remember hearing years later, actually, after I had left the department, that there was a woman there in the graduate department getting her PhD. And she was writing and researching on Dzogchen, the great perfection, like what we've just been studying, more or less, and the use of natural metaphors. (laughs) I have to say, I never forgot that because I I did feel jealous. I was like, oh, I want to do that. (laughs) That's a great PhD thesis topic. Okay, so now I want to go out with a story, and I'll just read the story to you. I won't do too much commentary, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory about Milarepa and the hunter. This is found on page 66. One day, the famous hermit poet Milarepa, after installing his disciples in retreat, withdrew to a cave to practice his own meditation in tranquility. The chosen location seemed to offer an ideal environment The beautiful scenery, the solitude, the support of the local deities, the singing of the birds and gentle babble of the clear brook combined in perfect harmony. So it was a shock when a ferocious barking disturbed the quiet of the place. The hermit soon saw from a promontory the interruption that was coming his way. He saw a black stag rushing toward him breathless and terrified. Great compassion arose in his heart. He made a wish to teach the Dharma to that animal so that it might be released from its plight and sang it this song. I prostrate myself at the feet of Marpa of Lodrak. That's his teacher. Listen, dear, whose head is crowned with splendid antlers, As long as you seek to run away from anything in the outside world, you will never be liberated from the hallucinations of ignorance. The time has come for you to renounce all this delusion. The maturation of karma is too fast for you. How could you escape it in an illusory body? If you want to run away, Flee into the essence of mind. Run to the dwelling place of enlightenment. 
It is sheer delusion to want to escape anywhere else. Therefore, put an end to your confusion and stay with me. Overcome by the fear of death, you hope to be safe on the other side of the hill and fear being caught on this side. But it is hope and fear that make you wander in samsara. I will teach you the six yogas of Naropa and show you how to meditate on the great symbol, Mahamudra. The six yogas of Naropa are classic teachings of enlightenment that primarily use the yogas, yoga, the inner heat and clear light, and transference and dream yoga, and all sorts of interesting, beautiful practices. That was his main lineage, the six yogas of Naropa. So Milarepa sang in a voice as melodious as that of Brahma. Anyone who heard him would have fallen under his charm. The deer in tears lay down at his feet. The hermit was wondering where the barking he had heard came from when a red-coated dog appeared barking ferociously. It says bitch here. <laughs> a red-coated bitch appeared barkingly, barking ferociously. Milarepa, saddened, directed his compassion toward her in turn and sang this song. I prostrate myself at the feet of Marpa of Lodrak. May he bless me that I may calm the hatred of beings. Wolf-faced dog, hear the song of Milarepa. You take everything you see as an enemy, and your heart is full of hate. Reborn as a cruel beast, you live in hunger and suffering. The poisons that torture you never subside. If you do not take possession of your own mind, what will you gain by seizing outside prey? It's your mind that is it's your mind that it is time to conquer. Give up your hatred and stay with me. Right now, under the influence of your unbearable aggressivity, you fear losing the deer on the so other side of the mountain while hoping to catch it on this side. But it is hope and fear that make you wander in samsara. I will teach you the six yogas of Naropa and show you how to meditate on the great symbol, the Mahamudra. Mahamudra is very similar to Dzogchen, natural state, beautiful teachings. So moved by the immense compassion of the hermit, the dog's hatred was appeased and she lay down by the deer. Milarepa said to himself that a sinister figure would surely come after the two animals. And indeed, he appeared, sweaty and rolling his eyes. He was the hunter named Kirawa Gompo Dorje. Foaming with rage at the sight of the dog and the deer lying quietly near Milarepa, he unveiled brutally against the hermit and shot an arrow at him that missed its target. Milarepa, thinking that a human being should at least be as capable of understanding as an animal, advised him to listen to his song before shooting any more arrows. I pray to all the great accomplished beings. May they bless us that we may be free from mental poisons. You, the man with the face of an ogre, hear the song of Mila. It is taught that the human body is a rare jewel, but looking at you, I see nothing precious. You, evil man who looks like a demon, you run after the pleasures of this life, but in doing so, you're heading for a fall. Yet, if you conquer the desire within, you will obtain true accomplishments. You will never control outer phenomena. Now it's your mind that you need to master. You will not satisfy your desires by killing the deer, but if you put an end to the five inner poisons, this is like um, attachment, aversion, hatred, um, pride, jealousy, and ignorance. So, but if you put an end to the five inner poisons, you will fulfill all your wishes. The more you try to defeat your outer enemies, the more they come in great numbers. If you simply master your own mind, you will put an end to all adversity. Instead of spending your life in harmful acts, you had better practice the Supreme Dharma. I will teach you the six yogas of Naropa and show you how to meditate on the great symbol. 
Still suspicious, but struck by the animal's behavior and the unusual power of this llama, the hunter inspected the cave to see if he was not dealing with a charlatan. But finding nothing in it but a handful of roots and leaves, he felt such intense faith that he offered Milarepa everything he owned, including the life of the deer, and asked to serve him. Milarepa was delighted at the re repentance of the hunter and accepted him as his disciple. The hunter, moved by the rectitude and kindness of the hermit, burst into tears and himself composed a song to Milarepa, in which he prayed for guidance. But when he decided to return to his family to settle his affairs and return as soon as possible, Milarepa dissuaded him by singing the following advice. You, the hunter, listen to me. The storm thunders, but it is only empty sound. The rainbow has beautiful colors, but it vanishes quickly. Worldly things, even when enjoyable, are only a dream. Desirable objects provide great pleasure, but give rise to harmful actions. Composite things seem to last forever, but are soon destroyed. What we had yesterday, we lack today. He who was alive last year is no longer there this year. Foods we eat for our well-being change into poison. The former good companion becomes an enemy, and those we protected with benevolence now cover us with insults. The evil you've done, it's you it will hurt. Among a hundred heads, your own is the dearest. Of your ten fingers, cut any, and it's you who will suffer. Of all wives, it's your own that you cherish the most. Now it is time to do something for yourself. Life is fleeting, and soon death will knock at your door. To postpone your spiritual practice is not reasonable. In fact, your dear one pushes you into samsara. It is time for you to follow a spiritual master. You will find happiness in this life, and even more happiness in lives to come. It's time to practice the Dharma. Upon hearing this song, Gumpo Dorje was fully converted to the Dharma and abandoned any idea of returning home. When he had received all the necessary teachings from Milarepa, he made them an inner experience through meditation and reached ultimate realization. Thus he became one of Milarepa's heart disciples, while the dog and the deer were released from their lower rebirth. He became famous under the name of Kirarepa, and you can still see his bow and arrows in the cave of Milarepa. So that's a classic style of these old stories. And really, it's very common for people, for whether it's Milarepa, who was really the most well-known um, songwriter of Tibet, uh, he would give many of his teachings through song. You also have, I've mentioned, the beautiful autobiography of Shapkar. Uh, that's another really fabulous book to read if you enjoy these songs of realization. And um, But often this is the structure of these stories. So I hope you found that enjoyable kind of story time before bed. And um, the name of the book that we're reading here again is On the Path to Enlightenment. On the Path to Enlightenment. Um, hard Advice from the Great Tibetan Masters, compiled by Matthew Ricard. R-I-C-A-R-D. The audiobook is great too. Yeah, so thank you everyone and uh, welcome new people and experienced people and uh, you're always welcome to drop in as you can. Eve will teach next class and uh, move on to the next um, topic which is now going to move us into the inner preliminaries. So we've just completed the outer preliminaries of the four thoughts that turn the mind and then with this extra chapter the fifth one on renunciation and then she'll move us into the next phase of the inner preliminary practices which are also very beautiful so thank you everyone i hope you had a good evening we are at time so i'm going to let you go